I'm uh, Pastor Tom. It's such an honor to be with you this morning. And um, I'm, I'm pastor of small groups here at Rockbrook, so I'm going to take a moment, since they let me preach, to plug small groups, if you don't mind. But we've started our small group summer semester sign-ups, and uh, small groups are, are, are where we get connected here at Rockbrook. You know, we are a church of small groups, and we believe that the church must grow larger because we want more people from our community to come here, but we also recognize that a large church has to get smaller, and that's why small groups are so important to us, because we want everyone here to be connected. We want you to know other people from the church so that you can get uh, that encouragement, that they can help you to grow in, in your faith, that they can pray for you, and you can pray for other people. And also our small groups are the place where we care and support for one another, so we, we get to serve people inside of our group. And then one of the other things is that we also use our small groups to serve people in our community. And that's the theme of our summer semester is it, that kicks off June 3rd. Our small groups will start meeting on or after June 3rd. But Pastor Rylan over the summer is going to be preaching about serving and servanthood and what that looks like. And uh, we're also excited to announce that we have our very own in-house curriculum called Serve. It's a four-week curriculum. Pastor Ryland does the teaching. We have uh, our very own people from our church that uh, are giving their testimonies. Um, if you did the Belong series, it's, it's, much, it's much like that. So along with the uh, sermon series that Pastor Ryland's going to do in the summer and the Serve curriculum, on Saturday, July 14th, we're going to have a Serve Day. And Serve Day is an opportunity for our church to show the love of Jesus Christ uh, by serving those inside these church walls and uh, those in our community. And so we're encouraging our small groups to do uh, a serve uh, project together, to do the serve curriculum together, uh, come to church together, and then uh, get, just get plugged into that serve day. And if you're not in a small group, I want to encourage you to consider that. Find a group, contact the leader, ask them if they're going to participate in the serve day, and then and then you just show up and you join them for the serve study, gather a few friends together, and, and plan a project to, together to do on serve day. And if you're in a small group that's not meeting for the summer, uh, consider gathering your group together and planning a project to do on serve day. That would be a great, uh, great way to connect through the summer. Or perhaps you could get plugged into one of these other groups that will be doing a serve project. A serve curriculum is only $5 for the DVD, and it's $5 for the study guide, and you can purchase those out at the information table if that's something that you're interested in. And if you're starting your very own group the very first time, we have a card we'd love for you to fill out, so that way I can begin to reach out to you and keep you informed and in the loop about Serve Day. So uh, and if you're a small group leader, I want to encourage you to just to be make, make sure that you're following up with those emails because we're, we're sending out information. We're going to uh, information is coming about our summer semester, serve day, serve curriculum, serve groups, all those kinds of good things. We don't want anybody to miss the opportunity to get connected with other people, to grow in your faith, to pray for one another, and to serve others. Let's jump into our message today. This message is designed for those who are discouraged. Maybe you are discouraged with your job situation. Maybe you're discouraged uh, with a relationship or your marriage or your kids or parents or maybe your faith. Anyone here discouraged today? Yeah, some of you are discouraged. Maybe you're discouraged because I'm preaching. <laughs> but hang on because I'm going to give you a few points that will help you out with that. My prayer is that today's message will encourage you. Book, we're looking at a, a minor prophet book called Haggai. And if you missed last week, I want to catch you up so you'll understand where we pick up in our story today. And then we're going to dive into part two called Persevering Through Discouragement. And last week, Pastor Ryland talked about how King Solomon had built this magnificent temple for God. It was mind-blowing. God dwelt in this temple, and people would come, and they would worship God there. In fact, people would come from all over just to see this temple. I mean, it was, just, it, it was awesome. But unfortunately, what we know when we read Scripture is that after King Solomon died, God's people 
turned uh, away from God and started to worship idols. And because of this turning away, God allowed a series of events to take place to try to bring their focus back to him. So in 587 BC, and they completely devastated Judah. And to add insult to that, God allowed them to completely destroy the temple. This magnificent temple that King Solomon had built for God to dwell in is completely leveled. And then the Babylonians took the Jewish people into captivity for decade, decades, for about five def, decades, about 50 years. Uh, they were in captivity. And so you can only imagine the relief they felt when they were allowed to go back to their homeland and start to rebuild. So under the governor Zerubbabel, about 50,000 or so people went back to rebuild the city. And the first priority was to build the house of God. And so they started building the temple, and they got the foundation in place, they got the altar in place, and then they were met with some opposition, with some resistance. And guess what they did? They just gave up. They stopped building the temple. So for 14 years, the temple just sat there. Nobody did anything with it. It was unfinished, but no progress. He would raise up a prophet, a man of God, that would come to the people and he would get them to turn their, from their ways and turn back to God and get them back at the task at hand, get them back at what God was telling them to do. And that's exactly what Haggai did. He said, the time is now. The time is now for us to stop building our houses. We need to build the temple. We need to put God first. The time is now. And here's where we'll pick up the story today with that context in mind. Haggai 1, 13 through 14 says, Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people and said, I am with you. This is good news. God said, I am with you. Say that with me. I am with you. Lord, verse 14, so the Lord stirred up the spirit as a rebel, son of Shetel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. So what did God do? God stirred them up. God stirred up the governor. He stirred up the high priest. He stirred up all the people. And, and God is so good. You know, these people had stopped building. He'd stopped doing what he had asked them to do. And then God comes and he says, look, I'm with you. And he even takes the initiative and stirs them up to get them going again. God is so amazing. He's full of grace and mercy. He cares about what his people are doing. And God will often do that in the life of a believer to tell you to go, go do this. I'm with you. God gave his people a sense of faith to go and start rebuilding the temple again. He stirred up their spirits. Let's continue. So it says they came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty. And they're saying, we can do this. We can do this. We can rebuild this temple. It can, it can be more magnificent than Solomon's temple. We can do this. And then one month goes by. And guess what happens? They fizzle out. So what happened? Why'd they fizzle out this time? Well, all the people gathered around the, the, the temple construction site, and they're like, this is it? This is pathetic. This is all the progress we've made? Everyone was discouraged. And let's be honest. How often does that happen in our life? We can get started, or we do it for a little bit, and, and then we, we quit. You know, we're going to do this. We're going to attack this. And I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's, maybe it's getting out of debt. You say, we're going to get out of debt. This time we're going to do it. We're going to get out of debt. And then Christmas comes. Oh, we forgot about Christmas. We're going back into debt. I'm going to go on a diet. I'm really going to lose the weight this time. Oh, it's Cinco de Mayo. Let's go to Jose Peppers. <laughs> we'll do the diet later. You know, it's January. We're going to go to the gym. Man, we're all there in January, right? On the treadmill, on the elliptical, lifting weights. And then by February, we're in the line at Krispy Kreme. <laughs> doing glazed donut arm curls. 
You know, we, we, we think we can do this, and then, and then we realize that we're not making the progress that we think we should, so we get discouraged. And that's exactly what happened to the people of God. They said, we're going to do this, we're going to build this amazing temple for God, and then one month in, they fizzle out. They get incredibly discouraged. But this is what happens next. God's discouragement. Haggai 2, verse 3. Haggai asked them on behalf of God, who of you is left that saw the house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it seem like nothing? You know, Bible scholars estimate that Haggai was probably around 70, maybe in his mid-70s when he wrote this book, which means 50 years prior is when they went into captivity, so he would have been around 20. So he, it's quite possible he was a teenager and saw Solomon's temple. He was probably in it, visited it on several occasions. And there's others there that are working on this second temple, the rebuilding of it, that had seen Solomon's temple. And so this is what God's saying. So in other words, who here is old enough to remember? God is asking so they can figure it out for themselves, so they can get to the root of their discouragement. So if you're discouraged today, you know, perhaps you're discouraged from, from one of the reasons we find as we look at these questions, two causes of discouragement. If you're taking notes, the first one is comparisons. Comparisons. They're doing the same thing that we often do. They are comparing their start with somebody else's finish. They're comparing their start with Solomon's finish. Our temple doesn't look as good as Solomon's, but they're not even done building the temple yet. And they get discouraged. You know, I don't know about you, but I get incredibly discouraged when I start to compare where other people are at and I'm not. You know, I mean, I get around some other small group pastors and, and, and they're in churches that are writing blogs and they're hosting conferences on how to do small groups and I'm doing good to just get through my email every day. You know, I get discouraged. You might be a guy and you're comparing, you're saying, you know, he, he's got a nice home, he's got an amazing car, he's got a loving wife, and I hate my job, and he's got a great job, he's got a nice home, I'm renting, I got a horrible car, it barely runs, I can't find anybody to marry. You know, you might be a parent and you're comparing your kids to somebody else's kids. You know, they go to private school and they wear matching outfits and they're getting college credit in the fifth grade. <laughs> you know, my kids are, are barely dressed. In fact, I don't even know if they went to school today. They're flunking home room. And you feel so bad. You want to get real discouraged, go to Facebook and, and Instagram. You know, she was invited to the party and I wasn't. He's traveling for the third time this year, and I can barely afford to go to the grocery store. You know, you're comparing all these different things and, and people, you know, and that's what they did. Our little pathetic attempt to build this new temple pales in comparison to the glory of Solomon's temple. They feel like failures. They're discouraged. The second root of discouragement is lack of progress. Lack of prog progress. They're a month into it. It's not going well. They're trying so hard and they're not getting anywhere. You know, we've all been there. You say, I'm going to go on a diet. This time I'm really going to do it. You know, you eat kale for a whole month. And then you get on the scale and you've gained two pounds. You know, you're trying so hard you're discouraged. You take two steps forward and three steps back. You know, maybe it's your lack of spiritual progress. You, th you think, I've been a Christian for this long and I'm still struggling with this? You know, I'm giving it all in my marriage. I'm giving it my all. And I'm not getting anything back. I'm so discouraged. And maybe you're praying for your kids and you're giving them good advice. You're doing everything you can to help your kids make good decisions. And you're like, how could you be so thick? You know, you're doing the opposite of what I'm telling you. And, and they're making bad decisions and you're just so discouraged as a, as a parent. It could be any a, a number of of things. We all live with this sense of discouragement at some point in our, in our life. And I want to show you what God tells His people that are trying to rebuild this temple when they are discouraged. 
God gives them the most simple instructions. That's what I, I love this book of Haggai. It's so short, and he's just so to the point, but he just gives simple solutions. They're just so simple. In fact, do you remember last week? Um, you know, they, they were struggling easy. And so if you missed last week, I'm going to encourage you to go back and listen to that, that message. They had stopped building the temple and uh, due to the, this opposition, and God wanted them to get back to it. And they're like, well, okay, so what do we do? And God basically said, it's real easy. Step one, step two, step three. Step one, go to the mountain. Step two, bring down the timber. Step three, build the temple. Go to the mountain, bring down the t- timber, build the temple. Real easy. One, two, three. That's how easy it is. You choose the hard right over the easy wrong. You just got to keep doing it. Three easy steps, but we still get discouraged. Why? God keeps it simple. Here it is. It's so simple. He talks first to the governor, then to the priest, then to all the people, and he tells them the same thing, Haggai 2.4. But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the Be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Joshua. Then he tells all the people of the land, be strong. What does he tell them to do? Say it aloud. Be strong. And then he says, and work. Be strong and work. Say that with me. Be strong and work. What do you do when you get discouraged? God says easily two things. Be strong, and then he says, do the work. Notice he didn't say, sit around and talk about it. He didn't say, sit around and dream about it. He didn't say, compare the results and stop working. What do you do when you're discouraged? You be strong and you do the work. You put down another timber. You go up to the mountain, bring down the timber, build the temple. The temple is built, but it's not working. Look, you have to consistently choose the hard right over the easy wrong. Consistently do the work. Go up the mountain, bring down the timber, build the temple. Be strong, do the work. Consistently do the hard thing. You know, it would be easy to go home. It would be easy to say, this is too hard. It's easy to say, this isn't good enough. It's easy to say, look, we're not making any progress, let's just stop. God says, do the hard right. Be strong. Show back up. Be strong. Keep doing this. Listen to this principle. This is one that I'm hanging my hat on. Successful people do consistently what normal people do occasionally. Successful people do consistently what normal people do occasionally. You be strong and you keep praying even if you don't see the results. You be strong and you continue to open up God's Word. You be strong and you continue to seek out God daily. And you continue to show up, you exercise, even if the numbers are going in the wrong direction. You be strong and you continue to pay that debt. Even if it's $10 a month, just $10 every month after month after month, you be strong. You be strong and you continue to love when other people are not loving in return. You be strong and you bring your best at work when everybody else isn't. You you be strong and and you show honor even when the person over over you isn't acting honorable. You be strong and you continue to love your spouse even when they're unresponsive. You be strong. When I sin, it really discourages me. You know, I'm a pastor and I want you to know the other day I did something I, I, and I hadn't done from. You know, I'm in, the, I'm in the middle of preparing this and I'm thinking, you're a pastor and you're going to stand up there and you're going to preach God's word and you did that? You know, I could have given up. But here's what I've learned as, as, as I've studied the Bible. The great people of God, if you look at their lives, they blew it. Moses blew it. Abraham blew it, King David blew it, Peter blew it, disciples blew it, but what did they do? 
They stayed strong and they continued to do the work. They continued to seek God out. They continued to go in His Word. They continued to pray. They were faithful. They were obedient. They stayed strong. They continued to do the work. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to continue to show up. I'm going to continue to preach God's Word. I'm down timber after timber after timber, and I'm going to build God's church until Jesus Christ returns. That's the decision I've made. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing what? For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we what? Why does God say be strong and do the work? Why be strong and do the work? Everything I've talked about is a setup to this main point of this whole message. You know, if I had ended the message now, that would have been okay. But all it really would have been has been a, a good pep rally. Come on, church. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Let's go. We can do this. But that's not God's way. That's, that's, that's incomplete. And I want to complete this today. God, God says, be strong and do the work. Why? For I am with you, declares the Lord. This is the key to living the Christian life. You be strong and you do the work. God is with you. If you read on, Haggai gives the people this message. It's not in your notes. I'm just going to read it to you. Haggai 2, 6 through 9. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations. And what is desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. God, he says, the glory of this temple, the glory of the present temple, is going to be way greater than the glory of Solomon's temple. How can that be? They had no idea that God was actually foreshadowing the New Testament. And here's the point to this whole message, and I don't want you to miss this. In the Old Testament, you had to go to the temple and offer a sacrifice to be right with God. You had to go to the temple and offer a sacrifice to be made right with God. And in the New Testament, God does something truly amazing. God comes to us and offers us so that we can be made right with God. Jesus crucified and raising from the dead is the greater glory. The New Testament tells us that those who are followers of Jesus, you are actually the temple of of God's Spirit. And because of that, your body becomes the glory of God. God places His Spirit inside of you. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? This is the most mind-blowing thought. Because everybody thought you had to go to the temple. And now God says, no. I'm coming to you. And you can be with me daily. I'm going to put myself inside of you. Romans 8, 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who lives in you. I hope you're getting this. The same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead 
lives inside of you. The same Spirit that raised a dead person to life lives inside of you. God's power and presence lives inside of you daily if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, I teach step two growth track. And in there, we talk about this idea of being filled with the Spirit and what that looks like. And I describe it as the difference between rowing a boat and sailing a boat. When you row a boat, it's in your power. A boat, you just sit back. You just steer. And then this power that you can't see fills the sails up and starts to push the boat along. You don't have to do the work. All you got to do is just sit back, relax, and steer it. That's what we're talking about here. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you don't have to do the work. 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Every time you put a timber down in his name, you are glorifying him. When you serve someone, you are glorifying him. When you love someone that is unlovely, he is getting glorified. When you forgive someone, he is getting glorified. When you lift up his name in worship, he is getting the glory. That's why you never have to be discouraged because you're not alone. God is with you. And not only is he with you, he is in you. You know, that's why coming together in worship is so important because God is not only in you, he's with you when he's inside other believers. That's why small groups are so important when we gather together. I'm in the midst of God, and God is also in me. Philippians 1.6. Be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Who does the work? He does. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Why? Because God's with us, and he's in us. Don't be discouraged. Be strong. Do the work. God is in you. Let's pray together. Father, today, we ask that you would give us the courage to put down another timber, to trust you, to be faithful, to do it in your strength, to be strong and do the work. We ask for your power and your presence in our life. And everybody, just keep your heads bowed because there's, there's, there's a group of people in here that I want to talk to. Maybe you've never given your life to But in order for that to happen, I'm going to tell you something that seems contradictive to what I just said. You don't do the work. You let God do the work for you. He's already done it. Ephesians chapter 2, we are saved by grace through faith and not by works. Not by works. And some of you are trying to get into heaven by works. I got to be better. I got to try harder. I got to stop doing these bad things. I got to try to be really, really good so that God will accept me, so I'll be good enough. You can never be good enough for God to get into heaven. Your smallest sin disqualifies you from heaven. And this is why God's love is so amazing. He doesn't make you go to a temple. He sacrificed His Son Jesus, the Lamb of God, the final sacrifice. The sinless Son of God died in your place, but He didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead on the third day. So that anyone, and that includes you, that calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. All your sins forgiven. And when he saves you, your body becomes the house of God and he dwells in you. You don't have to go to a building to experience God. God lives in you and you get to be around him daily. If that's you and you want to experience God's power and presence in your life, pray this with me. All you got to do is say, yes, yes. I accept the work you did for me, God. Heavenly Father, forgive all my sins. Make me new today. 
I believe Jesus came for me to seek and save me, to die for me. So I could live strong and do the work you have for me to do. My life is not my own. I give it to you all. In Jesus' name, amen.